Now maybe a subject that might be a little bit more controversial, limited distribution has been around for maybe 20 years in, in some form or fashion, I think going back to the days of Crixivan in the middle 90s and then, and then Synergis. Uh, these, these products used to treat rare conditions. Um, they're small patient populations and now you're seeing more and more products. I think last year we saw over 20 products that were launched into a limited distribution space. Uh, very narrow, narrow channels. As more drugs come to the market for orphan diseases, rare diseases, can these narrow networks survive today? Nick? So I, I think there's a place for limited distributed um, networks, um, especially in the orphan and, and, and rare disease area. Um, but as manufacturers expand those networks uh, into oncology and, and oncology products, um, I, I just see that that becoming a, a real challenge. I mean, you know, think in the future, not not too far in the future, where a, a patient receives, you know, three prescriptions and two of them for our new um, novel oncology medications that require limited distributed uh, networks. And they're two separate manufacturers and they have two different hub programs and they get sent to two different specialty pharmacies and now you have two uh, pharmacies calling a patient that just got diagnosed with cancer and, and, and they're trying to manage through all the complexities of, of the disease piece that they're handling. Now you have two providers calling you about two separate products and all these clinical programs and there may be a case where you don't even receive the medications at the same time. Pharmacy one may send it quicker than specialty pharmacy number two. It, it just becomes, and, and the maze that that would put on the providers and the patients, I, I just can't see that sustained. Um, you know, with, with the federal government being the largest payer um, within the next few years of healthcare, um, the, the narrow networks um, continuing to increase at, at, at a broad number, it's, it's, I, I don't believe it can be sustained. I, I think it's gonna put too much strain on the patients. You know, the other interesting thing that I always um, ponder is why are the limited distribution and narrow networks only in the United States? I mean, these are global pharmaceutical companies. Why are they only doing them in the United States? Well, it's commercial pay. Yeah, there's a number of reasons, but it, I think it's, a, it's an interesting perspective. I know there's over 150 limited distribution products, and I, and I know, Cheryl, you know, we may have different perspectives on that. Uh, maybe get your comments. Sure, sure. Well, I you know, appreciate um, uh, the perspective. I think um, there are instances when manufacturers do see the need to put drugs into um, a narrow distribution channel. It could be um, the cost of the channel. We see some manufacturers bypassing the wholesale channel, going straight to a limited number of specialty pharmacies. And this is for um, drug production, manufacturing reasons. Um, Ray talked about the ability to report out the uh, inventory information to a manufacturer. So we see that. We see, um, you know, in the pipeline as well, a lot of the um, smaller biotech companies are bringing these drugs not only all the way through to, to phase three, but even commercializing the products. So um, sort of big pharma sitting on the sidelines waiting till the products get approved before purchasing them. So uh, I, I think that with the small populations, high cost drugs, I think that we will continue to see um, manufacturers leverage limited distribution networks and again understanding um, levels of service, core levels of service within specialty pharmacies and then abilities of those specialty pharmacies to bring value to the manufacturer. And I think the, the resources may not be there for all pharmacy channels um, in some of these cases. When you look at some of the more complex REMS programs that some of these drugs come to the market with, um, you know, certifying the pharmacist or nurses that have to do the intake and collect the data, you know, some of the other channels just do not have those resources and services available to be able to provide the drug in a timely manner. So I think that's really important and, and may help to sustain the narrow channels as well for these drugs. I certainly do agree that there is a place for limited distribution, but I think we're also um, losing sight a little bit of the entire 
um, healthcare landscape, when you look at things like long-term care, um, we see double-digit growth in uh, long-term care dispensing of oral oncology prescriptions. And that, that really further fractionates um, care in those particular settings. So I think that um, while there is uh, while there definitely are um, reasons for limited distribution, um, I think that we just need to look at as a whole uh, how can we best ensure that patients have access to the drugs and also um, ensure that there's a focus on continuum of care and, and transitions of care uh, between those various sites as well. But don't you see that as a way that specialty pharmacy is further integrating into the entire um, collaborative network of, of caregiving. You know, uh, our specialty pharmacy is being measured on our ability to communicate with long-term care, with the oncology office, with the payer. So expanding that information, understanding uh, where the patients, uh, other agents are being filled if our specialty pharmacy is not filling them. Uh, keeping that list of drugs that, you know, the, the 360 view of that patient and sharing that information. And unfortunately, and, and not all specialty pharmacies excel in that area. And I think that's where we right. run into problems. Yeah, I think that's a great differentiating factor is when you're not, in our case, we're not only looking at the whole picture, we're actually taking care of the whole picture. You know, we've had um, hepatitis C patients that have started with us because of a hepatitis C referral, but we find out that they're um, co-infected and we start um, and maintain the patient even after their treatment of hepatitis C, we continue to service them um, and their HIV needs. So it's, it's yes, if you can do the whole picture and, and, and not segment the care, I think it's very important. In, in long-term care, like Stacy mentioned, there's, there's guidelines and, and state mandates that you know the prescription, if a patient gets admitted into a skilled facility, that meds has to be there that day and it's a med error if it's not given. And every day it's not given, it's a med error. And the facility looks at their contract to pharmacy and says, where is my oral oncolytic? Well, we're waiting for you know, a, a third party pharmacy to send it. Um, it, it becomes challenging. And I, I think that's something that um, needs to be, there needs to be better solutions there. Yeah, yeah I don't think uh, limited distribution has hit its peak yet. Uh, and if we just look at back historically, just over the last uh, five to seven years, I mean, the 80% of the drugs that are being approved are, are in limited distribution. I think until such time that it's, that it's proven that many of these orphan drugs and oncology drugs can be handled with uniform services uh, throughout the continuum of pharmacy, we'll, we'll still see some, some limited distribution. Although, I also believe that it's being blurred. I mean, Cheryl, as you mentioned, uh, especially pharmacy really isn't a bricks and mortar mail order facility anymore. It's really a, a concept of patient services. And I think once those services are uniform and that they're beginning to be, especially you know at Walgreens and at, at others, uh, you'll begin to see that those products will be available more broadly. Maybe in some limited distribution me method, there may be still some services that are required, but uh, at some point you will see. But I think we're still uh, driving toward the peak. Um, I guess another topic.